hello everyone and welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. I'm Renee Williams and I'm here with my co-host Billy Thomas and we both work in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources at the University of Kentucky and we really appreciate you joining us today. Yeah, certainly Renee. It's great to have everybody with us, whether you're joining us via Zoom or if you're on Facebook Live, we're delighted to have you with us. Um, another great show, Renee. You know, I'm, I'm excited about this one. Yeah, we've got a cram packed full again it seems like we, we seem to be doing this every week just filling it up but um you know you go to these big stores um, like home depot or lowe's or what have you and you'll go around the wood sections you kind of see all these little labels and you know a lot of people just don't know what those mean so we're going to try to clarify that today yeah we've got bobby ammerman and um eric gracie both on our uk forestry and natural resources extension team and they're going to be talking about this and it really ties into forest certification and the ideal of that these forests are being uh, managed in an appropriate and a sustainable manner. And those labels help give consumers some confidence that that wood is um, you know, from a, a sustainable source. So Eric and Bobby, if you all wanna turn on your um, cameras and get us started with this. Hello everybody. Hey Eric, hey Bobby, how are you all? Good, very good. Good, good. Yeah, I, I seem like I always come in here to do a cooking this bit, but I guess we're going to do something about trees and certification this time. Yeah, because not Eric is really not a professional chef. He's actually a forest certification manager. He just uh, moonlights as a professional chef. But we actually, have him on today doing what he's supposed to be doing <laughs> instead of cooking. <laughs> But Eric and Bobby, it is confusing, I think, for a lot of people when they see these labels on products and what does it mean? And I'm more glad that you all are here to try to shed a little light on that today. Well, the complexity of this, they'll probably be more confused when we're done. But we'll Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get started and kind of let them know what's going on. All right. This, this is, uh, I'm going to kick it off. Um, um, of course, we just introduced ourselves and I'm a, the uh, Forest Management Section Administrator for the Center for uh, Forest and Wood Certification, and then Bobby, Chain of Custody. Uh, and we'll kind of explain that a little bit more as we work our way through the PowerPoint. So uh, as the uh, you know the title of this presentation or, or uh, little segment is, is uh, what do these labels uh, and uh, mean that you're seeing on your wood products? Here's an example from McDonald's. They went from, uh, if you guys are old enough to remember the old, old styrofoam clamshells and all the bad publicity they were getting for, uh, for those type of uh, um, items that they were serving their hamburgers in. Now you're starting to see some of these green labels on their coffee cups, their Big Mac boxes. Um, you're, another example of these labels we're talking about about is uh, you'll see a lot of times on catalogs, magazines. Uh, it's this little label right here that uh, was often referred to as a green label. <clears throat> Even the post office has gotten into the game, the priority mailbox. It's a different, uh, it's the same type of label, green label from Sustainable Forestry Initiative. Uh, we normally just refer to it as SFI. Uh, <clears throat> and then almost all of your uh, um, uh, your paper, uh, reams of paper, a lot of times are going to be uh, carrying these green labels uh, <clears throat> and boxes, packaging. Uh, and this is a SFI again, um, label that you see on a lot of cardboard boxes. Uh, and then you also get a different, uh, this is FSC, it's for Stewardship Council. Uh, there's also uh, showing this as a green label notifying that this was a recycled, uh, came from recycled materials. Uh, so really all these labels are really designed to inform the consumer that the product that uh, uh, the wood product that they're uh, consuming or using in an environmentally responsible manner. Um, and the label also uh, represents the Forrester Wood Certification System is used to verify by this uh, uh, responsible management on the ground and as it, uh, as it makes the, the wood through the, the uh, manufacturing process. <clears throat> one thing that it's, it's probably my inner nerd in me, but one of the things that I think that's cool about forest and wood certification is it's a unique approach. It's a market-based approach for responsible forest management. And typically, if you looked at the way uh, developed countries and the United States, we've always, 
lean more towards a regulatory approach for a uh, uh, good uh, natural resource protection. So this is a different uh, different little mechanism that we're trying to use consumer to drive good forestry on the ground. Uh, so we've mentioned uh, forest certification uh, and it's just based on adherence to a set of forest management standards. Uh, and then we talked about wood certification. It's typically referred to as the chain of custody. And it is a, it's basically a an inventory process to design to account for how that certified wood material moves from one manufacturer to another. And Bobby will get into that in a little bit more detail uh, on the second half of the, the presentation. <clears throat> forest certification, uh, the goal is to prove that the forest management is done according to a set of standards that ensure sustainability. Um, what's kind of unique about for uh, sustainability, you would think that it's really clear, uh, but if you talk to four uh, foresters or other natural resource professionals and you ask them to, to define uh, for sustainability, uh, everybody will have a little bit different vision of what that means. Uh, so that's where these different, like I mentioned SFI and uh, uh, FSC, that's where these organizations and these certification schemes are re really reflect on how that organization defines that sustainability in their mind. <clears throat> uh, and the key to force certification, as well as the COC certification, is this verification, uh, uh, this third party auditing. Uh, and uh, this third party auditing would be an outside person will come in and verify that the uh, the uh, the company is meeting the standards of that certification system. So this third party auditing really is what gives uh, forced and uh, wood certification its legitimacy. So like I mentioned, there's several different certification systems uh, and getting back on this uh, the force side of things, <clears throat> uh, they all uh, really have some key elements uh, and, they're, and they all address the same things. They may have just some minor tweaks and variations on how they define or their sustainability, but they're all going to be looking at uh, uh, the force is able to provide timber, non-forced, uh, non-timber products in perpetuity. Uh, they're going to protect r species. Uh, uh, any type of archaeological sites, cultural sites. The other key that a lot of folks don't think about is the uh, local communities and the people that work in the forest, the local economies. Uh, most of the certification standards are going to address uh, the protection of the workers. Also, they, they're looking to make sure that the, the community, that the wood products or the forest uh, that's supplying the timber, that local uh, community benefits from that resource. And then some big picture things, landscape level, all those things are going to be addressed to some degree, regardless of what certification system uh, that you're operating under. <clears throat> so uh, I think the first uh, one, you know, I've been in this world of certification now for a few years, and I think the first few months you're just learning all the acronyms uh, and the symbols like this little, little tree here is SFI, Sustainable Forestry Initiative. PFEC, um, American Tree Farm System, ATFS, FSC. So it really becomes uh, what we call the uh, alphabet certification soup. I mean, it's crazy all the acronyms you get bogged down into. Uh, and uh, it's uh, like the little warning says, it can cause indigestion, but it also causes a little bit of confusion. Uh, but we're lucky to have the different uh, certification schemes that creates competition amongst the uh, certification bodies and it, it keeps, uh, there is a cost for the manufacturers and the companies that are in these programs. So it helps control the cost and also uh, keeps things in line from uh, not, uh, I guess more, uh, sometimes there some of the, the things that they would wanna see could get out of line if there wasn't this competition. Um, so we're looking, like I mentioned, there's a bunch of different uh, uh, certification schemes. Uh, PFEC, PFEC, it's a program for the endorse, endorsement of forest certification. This is a global scheme. 
FSC is also a global scheme. Uh, FSC is probably the most recognized uh, forest certification system in the world, as well as in North America and the U.S. Uh, PFEC, uh, they look at, the, and then it breaks down into a national schemes, and these are more uh, North America schemes like SFI, uh, American Tree Farm, uh, but they will accept wood uh, from a, a certified forest coming from these certification schemes into their global schemes, so that way it's a way to move North America and U.S. wood globally through that PFEC uh, global certification scheme. And FSC is uh, there. We have FSC certified forest lands in the United States, and they're also able to, to uh, move those globally with that uh, FSC labels. Hopefully that didn't get too confusing there. Um, I'll be around for any questions at the end. <clears throat> So I'm gonna let Bobby kind of take over from here uh, and he'll, he'll go into detail on what actually these labels mean and some of the different uh, versions and, and how things get uh, uh, labeled at the end. Yeah, so, so um, one thing I've mentioned here real quick is all these schemes, uh, they're all, you know, private organizations, um, you know, nonprofit, uh, private organizations. And so there's no government involvement um, in any of these schemes. So uh, that's kind of a, something important to, to point out. Um, you know, this right here is an example of a certified supply chain. So it all starts in the woods, right? In the forest. And as that wood is harvested and moves through the supply chain, each one of these uh, ownerships um, or businesses that take ownership of that wood has to be uh, chain of custody certified as Eric mentioned earlier. Um, and if all those uh, suppliers are FSC certified um, and the material originated from the certified forest, then that final product can carry uh, a label from that particular certification scheme. Um, if, if any of these, if any one of these suppliers is not certified by the scheme, then that final product cannot carry that label, okay? Um, now, PEFC is a little bit different. Um, and the fact that they they sort of can skip the logger a little bit, um, as long as that you know that chip mill or next processor in the in the supply chain can prove, document, verify that the wood they're using came from a certified forest, um, they use a risk PEFC uses a risk based approach uh, to allow that material to enter the supply chain and still be considered certified. Um, so a little bit different with PFC, but not much. But, but basically the idea to get here is, is that if, if you see a product with a label on it, um, everyone that had ownership, you know, basically everyone that handled the material has to be certified by that certification scheme uh, from that label. Okay, you can go ahead and advance there, Eric. Now, as Eric pointed out, the key to, as a consumer, the key for you to know that, okay, I see this label on a product how do I know that, you know, that uh, these companies, these businesses weren't just, you know, putting labels on things without any verification or um, without any, you know, as a co consumer, uh, without giving you any confidence that that material really came from a certified force? Well, um, every business that is chain of custody certified, they have to go through an annual audit process, okay? And that audit process <clears throat> involves someone that comes in externally, third part, what is called third party auditor. He comes in, he's not connected with the business anyway. He doesn't work for the business. He's not, you know, he's, he's not representing a trade organization necessarily that, that that business is part of. So he's completely independent. And as such, <clears throat> he's able to, to give a honest <clears throat> audit to that business. So if that business is cheating in some way or, or not using the correct material or whatever, the auditor is not going to have any issues with, with, um, with forcing that business to change its procedures uh, or removing the certification. The auditor has that ability to drop their certification. Okay, you can go on the next one. <clears throat> so if we look at these labels, this is FSC. And again, FSC stands for Ford's uh, Stewardship Council. And um, anytime you see, uh, well, first of all, there's two different types of labels. There's an on-product label, and then there's a promotional label. And these two labels mean entirely two different things, okay? Um, so for on-product labels, 
whenever you see, at least for FSC, whenever you see something like we see on the far left corner, um, you take your mat, your coarser uh, and point to it there. Eric. Um, when you see a label that says 100%, as a consumer, you know that 100% of that fiber that went into that product came from a certified forest, okay? Now, if you see, if you see an FSC label that has mix on it, uh, <clears throat> that doesn't mean that the, that the fiber all came from a certified forest. It may have, but you don't know that for sure, okay? And, and basically what happens is, is that that material that's, that was used, uh, it could have been mixed with non-certified material through the supply chain, or it could have been replaced by non-certified material in the supply chain. Now, one thing we do know that whatever that volume was used to produce that wood product, at some point it was purchased in that volume from a certified forest, okay? So you can't just, um, you know, you can't just kind of make up numbers and things like that. You, you have to show as a company, as a business, where you actually purchased material at some point in the supply chain that came from a certified forest, okay? And then you can only sell in that value, volume of, by which you purchased it in, okay? So if you bought 100 board feet, then you can sell 100 board feet of a, of a, of a mixed product, okay? Um, and when you're audited, all those numbers are checked and verified and all that kind of stuff so that uh, that prevents any cheating, okay? Now, if, if you think about it, you know, well, why do we have a mixed, why, why are we, you know, why are businesses allowed to mix materials or substitute materials out? Well, let's, let's look at a couple examples. If you look at a sawmill, for example, they have multiple piles of logs. They have, they have different link logs, different species logs, different grade logs. They're strung all over the place in a, in a log yard at a, at a sawmill. So it's impossible for them to duplicate all those sorts, right? So these certification companies realized early on, well, if we're gonna have any impact in terms of getting any volume out in the field um, that's certified, we're gonna to have, to, uh, you know, to have to adjust things to allow these sawmills to be able to participate in, in the game. So what they've allowed them to do is, again, purchase material, right? That came from certified forest, log that in, you know, into a spreadsheet or electronically. And then when they go to sell wood, you know, they can mix all those mix all those materials on site. And then when they go to sell, they can look in their spreadsheet if they've got, you know, credits or a hundred board feet where they purchased somewhere in the past, then they can deduct that hundred board feet from their spreadsheet or their electronic device, however they're, you know, they're making that calculation. And then um, they can sell that, that volume of wood on the output side, okay? So that's kind of how it works. Now, another situation is you take a paper mill, well, the, you know, Paper mills can't afford two digesters, right? To keep this stuff separated as it goes through their, through their mill. So what they do then is they're allowed to mix those, those chips together and digest them at one time. Uh, it just will be cost prohibitive for them to do it any other way. And so when you, you know, when you could see a mixed label and that indicates that, you know, chips that were hundred percent and chips that were non-certified were mixed together at some point in that paper production. Okay, um, and then of course we also have a recycled label for FSC. So those are the on product labels for FSC. If you look down below that, that's the promotional label. And you can see it says below the label, um, the mark of responsible forestry. So that indicates to you right there that wherever you see this, you know, if it's on a website, on a business card, um, you know, on a pamphlet that a business is trying to promote their wood products that you're selling, whatever, that, you know, there's nothing really certified here. They're just promoting the fact that, that they're certified, that that business is certified, okay? So you go on to the next one, Eric. Now, PFC is a little bit, a little bit different. It's kind of easier than what FSC is in terms of being able to uh, determine what these labels mean. Um, PFC doesn't have as many of them. And so uh, basically there on the far left upper corner, you see PFC certified. And you can, it says right underneath that the PFC certified line, it says exactly what that, you know, fiber could, could, could have come from. It could come from stained aluminum range forest, it can come from recycled, or it could have come from even controlled sources. So um, you don't have that division, right, within the label system as, as to what's what. Okay, and then of course PFC, PFC has their, um, um, their recycle label as well. 
So you can't, you don't get as much information for EFC as what you do um, S FSC, um, but but at the same time, they're a little more easier to understand. And then uh, this, this their promoting label basically just says right on the label, promoting sustainable forest management. So in that situation, you see that label, again, that's a promotional label. It doesn't represent anything about the product being, you know, any part of the product being actually certified. And it wouldn't necessarily be on a product unless it's a, you know, a paper handout or, you know, pamphlet or brochure or business card or something like that anyway. Okay, going to the next one there, and now SFI, they they have, uh, <laughs> they're, they're different, much different than PFC. They got a label for seems like everything, right? Um, so um, let's let's look at this last one on the top line there, Eric. Take your cursor and hold over it. Uh, SFI actually tells you uh, how much of that product uh, is certified, how much of it came from certified sourcing, and how much of it is recycled. Uh, you will see some variation of that um, on all of their their own product labels. Okay. Um, now that one just to the left of it, that actually I, I just noticed before. That actually is promotional label, and it says right on the label, promoting sustainable forestry. So that's not an on-product label. That should have been down there at the, at the next line. But, um, but anyway, that label is promotional label for FSC. Now, this one on the far left top line, that, that says certified sourcing, um, this label doesn't mean a whole lot, okay? <laughs> um, it basically just represents that, you know, and it, it's, it's an on-product label. But it basically just represents that um, there was likely some some uh, good force management training on the ground, or uh, you know, uh, training for loggers, or even sawmills in some cases. And it it doesn't really mean that the wood is or the fiber is certified. It's just stating um, you know that there's been some things done to promote good force management, but it's not certified. Okay, and then that very bottom one is. Uh, uh, label you'll see quite often, you know, uh, on different things. And again, that's just a promotional label from the SFI. And again, SFI is a North American um, certification scheme. You, you, you can't, you know, Europe or China or any of these other places, they don't really recognize FSC as being a, um, a good certification scheme. Okay. Um, but SF, SFI can still sell materials around the world, but they do it through PEFC, as Eric explained earlier. Okay, go on to the next one, Eric. Now, um, if you do mixed, mixed woods, right? If you mix certified content with non-certified content, all these schemes have requirements for what that non-certified content can be, okay? So it can't just be any wood, right? And I'm not gonna go through all of this. You know, PEFC is a little bit different than FSC and SFI is different than than these two, um, but if we just look at FSC, um, if that wood is mixed or substituted, right? Um, in other words, all of it is not not 100%, then that wood, that non-certified wood has to meet uh, those six principles there that we have listed in our FSC control wood, okay? And one of the things is the wood can't be illegally harvested. It can't come from a harvest operation that violates human rights. Uh, it cannot destroy high conservation value forest, and uh, it can't come from forest that's uh, converted to a non-forest use. In other words, you can't you can't log the property and then build a Walmart on top of it. Can't do that. Can't use that wood in a mixed label system. Okay, um, and the wood can't be can't come from a you know from any genetic manipulation, and um, the uh, harvest activity and even the manufacturing activity of the material uh, can't violate. Uh, International Labor Organization's core convention laws, okay, or rules, okay. Um, so, you know, to kind of take this all with a little bit of grain of salt, basically, if you see a mixed label, not all that material is certified, okay. Can't guarantee it come from certified forest, but you do know that whatever wood was substituted or mixed did meet a subset of criteria. Um, that's all positive for good forest man, okay. All right, you go on the next one here. Now this is our last slide and I always like to show this. Um, if you look at this tag, right? This is hanging on a sweatshirt, okay? So is that, you know, what is that label? What is it referring to, okay? 
uh, is it referring to the sweatshirt or what is it, you know, what does it mean? Okay. Now, if you look closely at the label, it actually says paper on, okay, mixed paper. Okay. So what can we, you know, what can we uh, determine about that or from that? Well, one thing we know it's referring to a paper product. So it's not referring to the sweatshirt. It's referring to the label. Okay. Just the, just the fiber that's in, that's in the, uh, I said label, but tag, I mean, just the, just the wood that, or the fiber that's in the tag. That's all that label means, okay? Um, which I guess is a positive thing, but you're talking about such a little material there, you know, I, I don't know. But anyway, um, uh, and the other thing is we see mix on it. So we know it's a paper product. So probably at some point um, there was wood purchased, right? Uh, by a paper mill somewhere or a chip mill that was 100%. And at some point in the supply chain, it got mixed with non-certified sources that would be controlled wood that would meet those sets of criteria that FSC has put forth in order for the, um, in order for non-certified use or input, okay? Well, that's all I got. Um, Eric, you got anything else to add? Uh, the only thing I think, Bobby, is that mixed label, um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it does contain at least 70% of certified material in it. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. So um, in order for that little tag uh, to carry that label, uh, it has to have at least 70% um, certified content. Um, again, not necessarily directly from the certified force, but at some point in the supply chain, there had to be in that volume, okay, versus certified 100% content, okay. But you know, um, one thing, uh, first of all, we greatly appreciate you all doing your presentation and we learned a lot during that. Um, one thing I wanted to know though is, why is it beneficial for them to put these labels on a hamburger container or, or a mat or something like that, you know, so, or that mix, you know, that that tag, what, why, what makes it so beneficial to be able to do that? Well, I'm not sure about the tag. Uh, again, I think that's kind of a stretch and, um, you know, I don't know who made that, that hoodie, if it was Carl Hart or who, but I can't remember, uh, or maybe it was North Face, I don't know. But anyway, whoever made that sweatshirt wants to promote that they're, you know, that they're not just out buying, you know, any kind of wood and destroying the forest and that kind of thing. Um, now, why they're doing that, I, I don't know. There might be other uh, products that they sell that's made of wood, so they're, they're trying to, to really promote that they're doing the right thing. Um, but if you, if you look at McDonald's situation, for example, um, they, they don't want, you know, picket lines out in front of their, you know, out in front of their stores that are claiming, well, you know, McDonald's, you're using this, this wood to make your paper bags. Um, that's coming from the rainforest, you know, in Brazil. Um, you know, McDonald's don't want that. And so to, to prevent that, to get in front of it, um, they, they will, you know, uh, build policies within the organization where they're only buying certified content, okay? And then they put the label on there to promote to, to uh, environmentalists or whoever might would, you know, would get out for their stores and, and, and do all that kind of stuff that, hey, we are trying to do the right thing here, we, we, you know, and um, and in some cases, they're spending a little bit more to get that, you know, um, so it does mean something because this whole certification process is not cheap. Um, every, you know, if you think about the cost for everyone that's in that supply chain that has to pay that to be certified, that adds up real quick and adds a lot to the, to the final product. And, and that's really why we're not seeing more uh, certified things out there, you know, uh, than what we do. You know, Bobby you brought up a good point. You know, I know Home Depot was one of the big players at, 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 here in the U.S. at kind of pushing that certification because they were getting a lot of protests against them um, for like, you know, selling old growth wood and stuff like that. So there was some pressure on them. So that consumer pressure um, is really kind of the driving force, it sounds like. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's, you know, there, there's some unique stories, you know, this all came from uh, really from, um, you know, the rainforest areas and, um, you know, back in the eighties, early eighties, late seventies and, and whatnot, you know, we were, we were cutting down rainforest quite at quite a, you know, at a rate. 
And um, so some of these groups actually um, convinced some, some larger box stores like Home Depot to just not buy wood from that region. <laughs> and it sort of backfired on the whole process because what happened was is these, these you know, the local, um, uh, the local folks there, the local people in that area, in rainforest areas, uh, they couldn't sustain themselves anymore because the, you know, logging and, and harvesting was their means of, of survival. And so uh, basically what they did when their, you know, when their markets dried up, they just started clear cutting, you know, rainforest uh, and converting it to agriculture, traditional agriculture for, you know, cattle grazing and that kind of thing. So, so the whole certification process kind of, you know, developed from, you um, these environmental groups realizing that, hey, you know, we can't, you know, we can't completely cut off uh, those activities because it's, it's, it's not going to reap what we want to sow. And so um, they, they built these schemes and it started with FSC. Um, how can we allow for a little bit of sales from those areas, a little bit of harvesting, uh, and still do it in a way that's sustainable um, and, and good for the environment? And so that's why we have these schemes today. We did have a question come in of um, what can a private forest landowner do to start the certification process with their own forest? I, I know Eric, this is Eric's Avenue, but I'm going to say this real quick. Just call Eric. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, that's right. Um, it, it really, yeah, the, it'd probably be just uh, give me, I can put my email or uh, uh, office number in the chat and just give me a call. Uh, and uh, that would be the easiest and we can figure out what, system might work best and what you're looking at doing. I guess everyone's forests would be different, right? So you can't really give a, just a definite answer. Well, if, you know, if they're looking at tree farm only, it may be more prudent for them to work through the state a division of forestry. If they're looking at FSC, then they're going to have to uh, enter into our group. And uh, if, and it's also can be a matter of ownership size. Uh, a small landowners are definitely going to be more oriented towards our group that we manage. Uh, large corporate lands uh, are going to probably need to stand on their own and, and get their own certificate. But uh, anyhow, we can have, I'll, I'll throw my stuff in the chat and, uh, and we can call and discuss it. That's Wonderful. A, I was going to say, Eric, the other thing I would encourage, you know, if one of the first steps in all of that would be getting a management plan for your woodland, right? And working with the professional right. forester to make sure that you're doing the appropriate thing. So that's the first step that anybody can get started down the road for certification because it is a requirement of, to be part of the system. Correct. Yeah, that's the key. You got to have a management plan. That's the first step. Yeah, really interesting stuff, guys. And it's more complex, like you said, Bobby, that maybe you might first look. You see all these labels and you just think it's good, but there is nuance um, to it for sure. Yeah, one thing that, you know, I probably should have mentioned is, is that like with FSC and that 100% label, um, at this point, we don't see um, any uh, market demand um, specifically for that label. Um, as long as it's got FSC on it, that seems to satisfy everybody. Um, you know, in the market right now, um, you know, you would think that, that, you know, having a hundred percent label on it would be, um, you know, would mean a whole lot more than what it seems to mean in terms of knowing that, that every bit of that fiber came directly from a certified force. But, uh, at this point it hasn't made much of a difference in terms of value. Yeah. You know, it sounds like we've got some more education to do to let consumers know, you know, uh, how important that is and uh, what all goes into producing those products and there is a difference between 100 percent and mix yeah we have to be careful about kind of what we promote though because you know industry doesn't really <laughs> they don't really want to see that 100 percent to be much of a driver right because it's a lot harder to achieve so um we we do have to be careful here uh you know setting where we're setting in terms of what we promote with the certification stuff well thank you both for joining us we greatly appreciate you being on today yeah all right. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Hopefully, Thanks. we helped out clear some of the some of the questions you may have had when you're looking at labels. Definitely. Or made it or made it worse. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good. Yeah. You can call me, uh, me or Bobby too, if you just want to have a, a more in-depth conversation on labels. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Sounds great. All right. Catch you guys later. Thank you all for being on the show. Appreciate it. Okay. Yeah. So moving on to our tree of the week. I know we've got another really great segment. You know, Laurie Thomas has been doing the tree of the week for us for 
since we began this show. And right. uh, we got another one that's really cool. Um, we're going to be talking about the Eastern Hemlock this week. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the Eastern Hemlock is kind of a special tree for many reasons. And Laurie will talk about some of those. Um, but it's also kind of being threatened right now. And we might get um, Dr. Crocker to talk a little bit about that after the segment. But without any further ado, Renee, I'll go ahead and uh, get that rolling. I'm Laurie Thomas with the University of Kentucky Forestry and Natural Resources Extension, and I'm here with the tree of the week, the Eastern Hemlock. Eastern Hemlock, Tosuga canadensis, is an eastern conifer of cooler climates. It's also called Canada Hemlock or Hemlock Spruce. There are four Tosuga species in North America, two in the east and two in the west. Eastern hemlock is a slow-growing, long-lived tree that may take 250 to 300 years to reach maturity and live as long as 800 years. It is considered a medium to large-sized tree that in mature stands typically grows 2 to 3 feet in diameter and up to 100 feet tall. Eastern hemlock is one of the most shade-tolerant trees in our forest. It can survive in as little as 5% shade. It is a graceful looking tree when young with a pyramidal shape and open grown trees will retain branches that often touch the ground. It is valued as an ornamental landscape tree and as a wildlife tree since many species of wildlife benefit from the excellent habitat that a dense stand of hemlock provides. Eastern hemlock's native range includes the southern border of Canada to Nova Scotia into New England into the mid-Atlantic and lake states and south into the Appalachian Mountains in northern Georgia and west into Indiana and western Kentucky with small pockets. In our state it is found mostly in the east. Eastern hemlock grows on a variety of soils that are moist and well drained. It is typically found in cool coves and ravines but can also be found on rock outcrops of north facing slopes. Hemlock is susceptible to drought and windfall due to its shallow root system. Eastern hemlock is an evergreen conifer. The leaf is a flat needle that is single on the stem. It's not in groups or in bundles like we see with some of our other conifers. The needles are mostly two-ranked. That means the needles are on opposite side of the twig and separated by about 180 degrees. And so that branch will kind of lay flat. The needles are typically about a half an inch long and taper to a dull point. They are shiny dark green on top and have two white lines of white stomata on the underside of the leaf. The stomata are the minute pores in the surface of the leaf or the needle. The needles usually persist for about three years on a tree. Eastern hemlock is monoecious, meaning a tree has both male and female flowers or reproductive structures. The reproductive structures are in separate clusters on the same branch in hemlock. The male reproductive structures or conelets are yellow, small and round, and in the axis of the needles from last year's growth. The female conelet is light green and forms at the end of the branch. The pollen is wind dispersed in the spring between April and June. And trees begin flowering by about 20 years of age and may flower up to 450 years old. Eastern hemlock fruit is an ovoid or egg-shaped light brown cone. It is usually three-fourths inches long with rounded entire scales. The cones change from yellowish green to purple brown when they mature. When they mature in the fall around mid-October, they are deep brown and the scales open to release the seed. The cones close in wet weather and open again when it's dry. This prolongs seed dispersal. Eastern hemlock has very small seeds and they are dispersed by wind, but usually fall within the tree's canopy range because their wings are very small. Seeds germinate the following spring. An eastern hemlock begins um, producing cones around 20 years of age and will continue cone production up to 450 years. It is a good seed producer with cone crops over 60% of the years. It is considered the most frequent cone producer among eastern conifers. Typically, eastern hemlock produces cones every year with large crops every three to four years. Cones will persist through the winter, and eastern hemlock does not sprout and, on, and only rarely will it layer. The bark of eastern hemlock is brownish on young trees and begins to become scaly as the tree grows and ages. On older trees, the bark is more of a reddish brown with wide ridges and furrows. And when the surface of the bark is freshly cut, you can see purple, dark purple streaks within that bark. The heartwood of eastern hemlock is light reddish brown and the sapwood can tend to be slightly lighter in color, but usually it isn't distinguished from the heartwood. 
The tree has noticeable growth rings, which can create an interesting grain pattern when the wood is flat or plain sawn. This is the most common method of cutting wood into boards. This method has minimal waste and also showcases a cathedral look of the annual rings. It is rated as non-durable regarding decay resistance. Eastern hemlock is one of the two primary commercial species of hemlock harvested in North America. The other is Western hemlock, Tsuga heterophilia. Eastern hemlock is an important wildlife tree. Numerous animals browse the foliage, including white-tailed deer, moose, snowshoe hare, and eastern cottontail. Mice, voles, and birds consume the seed, and porcupines nigh on the bark. Dense stands also provide cover for wildlife. Cove forests in the Appalachian Mountains provide nesting sites for many birds, including a variety of migratory warblers. The large hollow trees also provide denning sites for black bear. Eastern hemlock wood is used primarily as construction timber for light framing, roofing, subflooring, boxes, crates, and pulpwood. It is also widely used as an ornamental tree for landscaping. The graceful tree is handsome throughout the year with a much softer form than most of our other conifers. It responds well to pruning and shearing and is often used as a hedge. Currently, there are more than 50 different cultivars of eastern hemlock. Eastern hemlock is under attack by the hemlock woolly adelgid, which is a small sucking insect like an aphid that threatens the health and survival of eastern hemlock trees. The adelgid was introduced from Asia in the 1950s and has spread throughout much of the hemlock's range, including Kentucky. The adelgid attaches to the bark at the base of the needles and sucks the sugars from the trees. Their feeding causes needles to dry up, turn a grayish color, and fall off, die and fall off. In addition, because the adelgid kills the apical bud, it prevents the tree from producing new growth and heavy infestations can kill a tree within four to ten years. The last national champion eastern hemlock listed was in 2013. Currently there is no champion listed. In 2013 that national champion was in Macon, North Carolina in the Great Smoky Mountains. It was 192 inches in circumference and 159 feet tall. The Kentucky champion eastern hemlock is in Letcher County and it's 149 inches in circumference, 135 feet tall, with the 50 foot, 53 foot crown spread. If you'd like to know more about champion trees, check out American Forest Champion Trees, or check out the Kentucky Division of Forestry Champion Trees. Now for a few fun facts about Eastern Hemlock. Eastern Hemlock is the state tree of Pennsylvania. From the 1880s to the 1930s, Eastern Hemlock was extensively harvested for its bark, which, which was used in the leather tanning industry. Tragically, only the lower bark was peeled off, leaving the standing tree to slowly die. Although this tree is often confused with the hemlock that Socrates drank, which was poison hemlock, Conium maculatum, Eastern Hemlock is not poisonous. Its needles have been used to make a tea that's high in vitamin C. One of the largest eastern hemlocks recorded had a circumference of 238 inches and was 175 feet tall. The scientific genus name Tsuga is the Latinized form of the Japanese common name of hemlock, and the species name Canadensis means from Canada. Thank you for joining me to learn about the eastern hemlock. I hope you get the opportunity to get out into your woodland, local park, or neighborhood and enjoy the eastern hemlock. Well, I always look forward to those videos every week. We learn we learn a whole lot from Lori. I appreciate her doing that. Yeah, it, it, it's very interesting. And um, yeah, the Eastern Hemlock is such a beautiful tree and it plays such an important role in the environment. You know, it keeps a lot of our streams cooler and it provides shade and protects them. Um, but as Lori mentioned, it is being threatened heavily right now um, by the Hemlock Woolly Adelgid. Um, you know, Dr. Crocker, I don't know if you're available and want to speak to it a little bit, but there are some efforts going on by the Kentucky Division of Forestry and some others that are trying to kind of do that if you mind to let everybody know kind of what's going on with um, him I, I think next week we're going to hear more about that because we're going to have Alexander Blevins from the Kentucky Division of Forestry on to talk a little bit about what they've been doing and they've been involved in a range of different projects um, treating those hemlocks with uh, insecticide to protect them from the hemlock willy adelgas especially in really sensitive areas that we really don't want to lose those trees um, as well as some newer work trying to introduce some predatory insects that will find and attack those adelgids um, and that's kind of more experimental trying to see if it works in our area and could it be part of the long-term you know success of of hemlock um, so so join us next week to hear more about that
No, that's a good segue in for me. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Crocker. We'll look forward to seeing that next week. Um, all right. Um, Renee, you want to move on? I want to talk yeah. about a, something that's really sweet. Uh, really sweet. <laughs> Really, really sweet. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, recently we, we had the Kentucky Maple School, and it's really to try to highlight the potential for maple syrup production here in Kentucky. Um, and, you know, as part of that school, we had some great presenters. And, Renee, we've been working on a lot of maple syrup stuff here out of our department. And I was wondering if you could share the website. Um, sure. One of the things we've been working on is a website, um, and we'll put this in the chat pod. And um, we've got, and it's still kind of a work in progress, but there is a lot of great information on there. If you're curious about maple syrup production, um, maybe you've been doing it for a while or maybe you're a brand new producer. Um, but it, as you can see here, we've got a few different little sections that you can check out. And one um, I'd like to kind of highlight, Renee, is the Maple School. So we, we held the Maple School a little while back, um, first in November, and it really went really well. We had a great attendance, and fortunately, we were able to record that. So the uh, recording is available, um, and it's free to watch. You just have to put in a little registration information, and you can check it out. And it's a really good way to kind of learn about the potential of what Maple Syrup could be. So that, Renee's highlighting that button, so we'll put that in the chat pod as well. Um, Renee, I'd like to next show them um, our research page. One of the things that we've been doing here in the department is working to try to help some of these producers. Uh, um, a number of our county extension agents have been heavily involved in maple syrup production and there are, there are the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources is trying to work with and support those agents. Um, Shad Baker and Letcher County and um, Jeremy Williams and Harlan County um, for, for sure, um, but there's others as well. And as part of this um, kind of trying to support these producers, we were able to secure a couple of grants and and, and these grants are allowing us to kind of connect with and build a community of people that are interested in maple syrup production here in Kentucky. Um, so if you were a brand new or a beginning, maybe you've just been doing it for a year or two, we have a place for you to kind of learn a little bit about an opportunity, a citizen science opportunity for you to kind of participate with us. Um, so we're looking for a, a, a number of landowners that are willing to kind of tap some trees um, and give us some data. And in return, we will give them all the supplies they need um, to tap of 10 to 15 trees. So there's a little survey that you can complete if you're interested in that. And I would ask you to please share that. And if you personally are not interested, please pass it along to somebody else that may be interested in that. Um, Renee's showing you a quick little form that, and it's just real quick. We just want a little bit of information so we can follow up with you and kind of get that process rolling. We also have um, a section that we're trying to work with some of the experienced producers as well. So if you are an experienced producer, maybe you've been doing this for a while, um, we want to learn from you. Um, a lot of the research that's been done on maple syrup and production is from the Northeast, and we don't have a lot of specific data for here in Kentucky. So what we're trying to do is work with existing producers and, and new producers to gather some data that we can then use and develop some best management practices. And, um, you know, one of the other team members that we have on is Dr. Jacob Muller. Um, Dr. Muller is part of this ACER grant that we recently received. And um, Jacob, you had a chance to film um, a short video with um, one of our colleagues, um, Zach Hackworth, to kind of show a little bit about what this um, citizen science opportunity might be like. Yeah, we did. Um, we actually, we showed the video at the, uh, the Maple School, uh, and we thought we'd show it again here uh, to you all, but it, uh, Zach really does a great job of, of uh, highlighting the, this opportunity uh, to join the citizen science project. And uh, he even gives a little demonstration um, to how to tap a tree and, and kind of the equipment that would be involved with uh, your participation as a citizen scientist. So maybe we can go ahead and show that video. And The Department of Forestry and Natural Resources is proud and excited to offer Kentucky's forest owners an opportunity to be a part of Kentucky's growing maple syrup industry. In September of 2020, a multidisciplinary team of researchers from our department, as well as folks from Extension and current maple producers in the state, were awarded a half million dollar grant by the U.S. Department of Agriculture to help grow Kentucky's maple syrup industry. Now, while there are several programs planned under this new grant, 
One particular project that we're excited about is an opportunity to engage brand new producers in producing maple syrup, while at the same time garnering important research data. You see, because maple syrup is a relatively new industry in the state, there's not a lot of information known about how sap production is influenced by tree characteristics, as well as the interaction of climate and terrain characteristics. And that's what we're hoping you can help us with. We are seeking 20 forest owners who have no experience in maple sap collection with which we can help get off the ground and producing maple syrup. To each participant, we will provide all the materials required to collect maple sap for 12 to 20 trees. We'll provide containers, buckets with lids, as well as taps and tubing and other equipment required. We'll also provide technical assistance in tree selection, which trees are the best to tap on your property, as well as assistance in tapping those trees. All of this will be provided free of cost to you. In return, all that we ask is that each time you go to collect your maple sap, you take a few short measurements out of the buckets. That's it. That's all there is to it. It's a win-win for everyone. What we get is important research data regarding sap production on the trees in our state. And what you get free of charge is all the materials required to get up and running with sap production. And today we're going to give a brief introduction and tutorial on how to install a gravity driven maple sap collection system. So the first thing you'll need to do is you'll need to compile a set of materials. First thing you'll need is some form of container to store your maple sap in while it's being collected. Today we have a five gallon plastic food safe bucket, but you can use any form of container that you'd like. And we also have a lid for that. And the lid is important to keep out contaminants such as leaves and twigs and insects while the sap is being collected. <clears throat> the next thing you'll need is you'll need a tap. We have, we're using a 5 16th inch tap and tube system. And the tube is important because it will ensure clean collection from the tree and the tap into your container. Other things you'll also need, you'll need a cordless battery drill with a drill bit. You'll need a hammer or some type of small mallet for tapping the spile or the tap into the tree. And then also, if you'd like, you can purchase other equipment that'll make tapping easier. And today we have a crimp tool that will help us attach our spile to our tubing. So when approaching a project, for maple sap collection, the first thing is tree selection. What type of trees am I looking for? Well, obviously you're gonna be looking for maple trees. Sugar maples and red maples make the best syrup. Today we have a red maple. And after I find my maple tree in the forest, I need to ensure that it's of adequate size, okay? So maple trees that are at least eight inches in diameter can be tapped for syrup production. We've pre-measured this tree and it's approximately 15 inches in diameter. So now we'll zoom in and we'll discuss how to tap the maple tree. So now that we've selected our tree and we've compiled our materials, let's talk about drilling the tap hole. The first thing that I need to do is I need to select a face of the tree to drill the tap hole in. Many people will select the south side of the tree because that side receives sun and on a cold day, that side will warm up first, the sap will begin to flow sooner, and will receive increased sap production. For today's instructional purposes, we're drilling on the northwest side of the tree to avoid the shadows. To drill the tap hole, I'm gonna use a cordless battery drill with a 5 16 inch drill bit. That I drill the tap hole. So I'm gonna hold it at about chest height, where it's comfortable, 
As I place the end of the drill bit on the tree, I want to ensure that when I drill, I drill at a slight upward angle so that the sap will flow readily out of the tree. It's important to note that after I've drilled the hole, I clean out any chips that might remain in the tap hole. We're using a specially designed tree, tree tapping bit that has deep furrows that cleans the chips out for us. But you can use any type of drill bit. You can use a regular wood boring bit. But if you do, you'll need to ensure that you clean out the tap hole afterwards. So once we've selected our tree and drilled our tap hole, we need to begin the assembly of our collection system. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my spout and I'm gonna attach it to my tubing. So this particular spout has barbs on the end of it to keep the tubing from sliding off. So it's gonna require a crimp tool to fully seat the tubing on the spout. So I'm gonna start it onto the spout, finger tight. Then I'm gonna take my crimping tool and I'm gonna set this in the clamp and I'm going to simply finish sliding on the spout to the tubing. And now I have an assembly ready to be inserted into the tree. So now that I've inserted my spout into my tubing, I'm ready to tap the spout into the tree. And this process is called tapping for a reason. I'm gonna lightly tap the spout into the tree. I don't need to rear back like I'm setting a 16 penny nail. So I'm going to insert this into the spout into the tree and I'm going to lightly tap it into place. As I'm tapping, I will hear a change in the pitch of the tap. And it's at that point that I'm going to stop. It needs to be snug, but it doesn't need to be tight. If I tap too far, I may end up splitting the tree at the tap, which will result in loss of sap out of those fissures. So the final step of my setup is to place my bucket, trim off the loose end of my tubing, insert my tubing into my bucket, and place the lid on the bucket. So I have my bucket, and note that I've drilled a small hole in the top edge of the bucket in which I will insert my tubing. When I place my bucket, I'm going to find a nice level place to put it to ensure that it doesn't tip over when it's full of sap. Once I've found a nice flat place, I'm going to take my tubing. I'm going to find the length that I need to insert it into my bucket. And then I'm going to leave an extra six inches to ensure that there's sway if the bucket were to move back and forth. I have a set of lineman's pliers that I'm gonna to use to cut the tubing. Then I will insert the tubing into the bucket, take my lid, and ensure that it's nice and secure on my bucket. And now I've completed a simple collection system for maple sap. Seems like anyone could do it didn't seem like it would be that hard to uh, start tapping trees <laughs> yeah so this is a great opportunity for people that are just interested and you know the nice thing is we're supplying the materials so they don't have to figure out what to buy or how to get started and we're going to try to help them you know yeah. I want to point out, though, is, you know, even if you're an, a, an experienced producer, we still want to work with you. And there's opportunities that we want to work with you, too. We're looking to kind of collect data on your sugar bush, where you're collecting that information, weather data, location data. And we've got some other equipment that we can kind of maybe get to you all as well. So regardless of your interest level, Jacob, I would tell them that we want to work with them on this really sweet project. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Good. 
So um, if they're interested, then they just need to go to the website and do that survey then, and that's how you all get them yeah, in the program? We will follow up with them, and I would say, you know, if we've got some county agents on here, and I see that we do, please share it through your networks. We think there will be some people in your county um, that would be interested in it, and if you're a, um, you know, if you're not an agent, but you know of others, please help us spread the word about this opportunity. Okay. All right. Another great show, Renee. Yeah. Yep. Really appreciate everybody being with us. Again, whether you joined us via Zoom or via Facebook Live, we're delighted to have you with us. Um, we'll be back with you next week um, on another exciting show. So make sure you tune in at 11 o'clock on From the Woods Today. Yeah. And remember, you can see any of our shows at fromthewoodstoday.com if you missed anything or just like, okay, had they tapped that tree, then we, we you can see it again and watch it again. So until then, take care. All right. Bye, everyone.